We might be too young to have a spotted cow, but we are both diehard Packers fans. I could talk about this for hours. He was my legend. He was my quarterback one. Taysom Hill, forever in my heart. We have a kind of a reputation of being the young, the young diehard fans. How is that, Dr. Pepper Taysom? Amazing. Okay, good. Let's keep it over 25 minutes, all right? How are we doing, everyone? This is Joey here at Underage Packers. Today, we are, as we are recording this, a short two weeks away until Packers training camp kicks off before the whistles are blowing, the shorts are on, the pads are on, and they're hitting, start playing some good old-fashioned football. Guys being dudes, nothing better than it. Only two weeks away from that greatness. Joining me just as excited is my co-host, Big B. How are you feeling two weeks out? Uh, I, I want it to get here faster than two weeks. I don't know how yeah. that's possible, but it needs to happen. I saw somebody on Packers.com, Insider Inbox, a series that Wes Hockwitz, Mike Spafford do all the time. They said they felt like a kid on December 10th waiting for Christmas. I feel that. You know, I, I was thinking like, man, I should have had an advent calendar. Uh, you know, the one that you tear, you get something new each day, like a little candy before Christmas. Should have had that for training camp. That would have been fun. But it's too late now. Thankfully, we're only 14 days away. By the time this episode is out, we'll be even closer. So we'll be getting closer to that. Um, but with that, today we're going to be talking about training camp as we are going to go position through position and talk about one player that we are interested in watching in this training camp, in this preseason, just a player that has, you know, a lot of question marks going into this training camp, has a lot to prove, uh, can step up in the preseason, maybe work their way onto the roster, and it should be a fun time. This is really like where you get to show off your nerdy knowledge uh, when it comes to being an NFL fan. This part of the offseason, if you're recording a podcast and talking about guys like Cole Van Lannan, Tyler, Tyler Goodson, Jack Heflin, just a few of those guys we're going to talk about today, then you are like certifiably a nerd and you're proud about it. So with that being said, let's start off with the quarterback position. Um, for this one, it's a unanimous choice between both of us. Aaron Rodgers has nothing to prove in the preseason or camp. It wouldn't really make a difference if he was there or not, at least, at least for him. Wide receivers might have been hurt by his absence in minicamp and OTAs just by not having those, you know, two or three walkthrough practices um, to build some chemistry with him. But he's got nothing to prove, nothing to earn, nothing to lose. But right behind him, Mr. Jordan Love has a lot to prove this offseason. Um, and, you know, his position now, with the Packers and how his future looks like is very different um, from what it looked like when he was drafted um, three years ago and what it looked like last soft season. And really the changes in that really have nothing to do with his play and more so with Aaron Rodgers. Um, Love has only played in a few games, few in garbage time, you know, had a really tough game against the chiefs in his first ever start uh, when Rodgers was out with COVID you know, we saw him in the preseason last year. Unfortunately, didn't get to see him in his rookie season at all. Um, but saw him in preseason last year. He had his moments. Um, according to the reporters that have seen him at minicamp, OTAs, have seen him at all of the practices throughout his career. Um, the main thing I get is that they see him as very, I, I don't even know if inconsistent is the right way to put it. It's really just one day he's John Elway and the next He's Deshaun Kaiser and Brett Hundley. Like there's no in between with his practices. Um, so Big B, what do you think Jordan Love has to gain this year and the preseason and in training camp? I think the preseason mostly is going to be most important for him. But what do you think he has to prove? What do you think he has to lose? Yeah, this is um definitely a make or break year for Jordan, in my opinion. I think you're really pushing for either a potential trade mm -hmm. or if Rogers does retire the next, maybe, I don't know. When does his contract up like next year or something? He, he could retire. I think, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a long few years every off season having to deal with all his drama that he brings up. Yeah. And it could potentially get a contract extension with green Bay. Mm -hmm. 
So he's definitely pushing for that. Um, yeah, Jordan just – he just needs to be better overall, I think, in live action. Like you said, he's like John Elway one day and freaking who Matt Corral or something. I don't know who all that is. But, yeah, yeah. Jordan – He's a step up in live game action. Definitely a big year for him. And did you see that picture of him? He looks like – he looks swole. He, that man yeah. looks hell up. He, he is beefed up a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think for Jordan's camp, like you brought up, of possibly a trade out of Green Bay because I just think it has to be so frustrating for him. We brought it up um, when it was announced that Aaron Rodgers was coming back. I mean, how frustrating does it have to be for this kid? Uh, I say it's a kid. He's six or seven years older than us. But um, how frustrating it has to be for him to come out of Utah State and be being talked about as a first-round pick. I mean, early on in the draft process, it was thought that he'd be a top-20 pick. So he has this in mind, like, okay, I'm going to you know, go out there, be a franchise quarterback for a team, get my foot in the door at least with this team that I'm going to get drafted to. Um, even if I don't start my first year, I'll get, I'll get my work way, my way up. I should be a starter at some point early on in my career. And now here he is going to enter year three. He's got no idea. I mean, this year he's not going to start at all unless something bad happens next year, probably not going to start at all either, unless he's, is traded out of Green Bay or Aaron Rodgers retires, like you mentioned. So it just has to be really disappointing for him. I'm sure like this has nothing to do with what I think Jordan thinks about Green Bay. Like I'm sure he understands why they drafted him and he understands why they kept Aaron Rodgers after two MVP seasons, but I'm sure he is just dying to prove himself to other teams to give them reason to trade for him. Um, and give Green Bay compensation that they couldn't deny. Um, you know, just a few good preseason games that he can put together, uh, and maybe he can work himself out like a Matt Hasselback type story. Um, so preseason is going to be big for him just to prove to the Packers that they shouldn't give up on the Jordan Love project. So there's the quarterback talk. Uh, next up, running back, I decided to go with Patrick Taylor here. I would go with Kylan Hill because I am really intrigued to see what he does in his second year. But Patrick Taylor is, you know, Kylan Hill is going to be out of training camp most likely with his ACL injury. So Patrick Taylor is really going to be the running back three um, for most of this offseason program here. In the preseason, I'm sure we'll see him a lot. I think he has shown a lot of promise early on. Um, and I think he has a lot of potential to be a running back three. Um, I was really disappointed in kind of the limited uh, opportunities he got last year, even when uh, either one of A.J. Dillon or Aaron Jones was out. Um, so really excited to see what Patrick Taylor can prove. Uh, he looks pretty decent in the preseason last year, so maybe he can do the same this year. Big B has an interesting choice here. Um, tell us about Tyler Goodson. Yeah, um, I really like Tyler Goodson coming out of, um, I think it was Iowa. He he went yep. to college. He put up some very good numbers, and I'm surprised he actually did not get drafted in the seventh round. I think this was a potential gem that um, the front office found in Tyler Goodson. I'm really excited to see what he does when the pads come on, and I think he can definitely make a push for that third running back spot. Oh, yeah. Um, the preseason, like I just said with Patrick Taylor, man, like, so I'm really excited for the running backs just because I feel this is the second, third year where that running back three spot is just up for grabs for a handful of undrafted players. Um, I really like Mike Weber just because he was good at Madden. But Tyler Goodson, first off, when it comes to Goodson, shout out to Paul Brettel, who had pretty much a player profile on every single undrafted free agent the Packers drafted. And I know he shared a few highlights of Goodson. So I have a lot of hype about him. Um, I, I'm trying to find college stats for him on ESPN, but it's not showing me anything. But I'll believe you that he put up some good numbers in that Iowa offense. Uh, next up, wide receiver has to be the most interesting position of all this training camp as Aaron Rodgers looks to build some trust 
build some confidence in his pretty much all new, very young wide receiver room. And I'm going with the headliner there in Christian Watson, the second round draft pick, pretty much a first round draft pick. He was the second pick of the second round. The Packers traded up uh, 28, 29 spots to grab him. They clearly liked him after they had a lot of uh, quite a run of wide receivers go in the first round ahead of them. They weren't able to pick one up there. So they thought, hey, you know what? We won't reach on him. But we'll, if he's still available there at pick 33, we'll go up and trade with our rivals, the Vikings, and go up and grab him. So I do think he has a lot of expectations to meet, at least from the fans going into his rookie year. He's certainly going to be relied on a lot as he is. I mean, I, there's no way to me he's not the fourth wide receiver to start the year. So he's going to be getting a lot of playing time early on. And, um, yeah, he'll, he'll have to show up, build that trust with Aaron Rodgers early on, maybe show up in the preseason, make some big plays, and terrorize the rest of the league. Big B, I love your choice here at wide receiver. How about you share it with us? Yeah, I went with Amari Rogers. I am very excited to see what he does this offseason. Definitely a player I'll, I'm going to have an eye on all throughout training camp. I, um, Randall Cobb and who's our wide receiver coach? I'm having a, I'm having a blank. Uh, Rabel, is he still with us? Right. I think, yeah, I think it's Rabel said that he has looked a lot more confident in the offense this year. Hey, I believe Cobb. Like, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know who doesn't trust him by now. Like Randall Cobb is a trust, trustworthy person. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to see what he does. I think he's going to have a bigger role in this offense this year and will definitely surprise all the haters out there. Absolutely. Yeah. His reputation kind of got ruined because of his punt returning lack of ability in that area a lot of fumbles but I did realize I was just looking up a few days ago that he only had like 10 or 11 offensive snaps and all but one or two of those probably came against Arizona so like we really have not seen much of Amari on offense um and I know a lot of people even had like they found that concerning that he wasn't getting offensive snaps like wow he can't get on the field at all, even when Randall Cobb misses half the season, then what does that say about what the coaches think about him? What are they seeing in practice? And I guess that's valid, but I still think there's a lot of ball game left. Still a lot of opportunity for him to return to the dynamic player that he was at Clemson. Um, so really looking forward to Amari Rogers, hopefully um, getting his confidence back and being able to be a star or we won't go to a star level, but let's get him on this offense, be a valuable piece on the team. And I, and I will say oh. that, like, even Randall Cobb didn't get that much playing time. So saying that Amari right. Rock is not getting enough playing time when Randall Cobb isn't even getting enough playing time, I think that's just wild. I know. Side note, Randall Cobb, like, why, like, is he not one of the perfect pieces for a Malifleur offense? I know he's 32 years old and not – a young player like Debo Samuel that Kyle Shanahan has, and I'm not comparing the two, very different players, but like Mike McCarthy, for Christ's sake, used him in a dynamic role. Like, Matt, like I know this isn't what you asked for in Randall Cobb. I know Aaron Rodgers, like this was his Christmas list, but use what you got. I, I was surprised to see that too, and I do think he – should and Matt LaFleur will be kind of forced to use him more in this upcoming year. Now on to another very interesting position that is, you know, kind of up in the air. A lot of question marks there too. A lot of, I guess you could say, uh, like mismatch puzzle pieces maybe uh, in the tight end position um, with Robert Tunyon most likely missing a lot of training camp at least and Early on in the season, I know you did. You were the first to report, Bigby, uh, with your one-on-one interview with him at minicamp, uh, that he is hoping to be back for week one, ready to go then. But uh, until then, um, there's a lot to, to be asked about that position. Uh, for the player I'm watching, it is Tyler Davis, who was just one of those players that was randomly signed onto the Packers, I think it was in the off season of last year or 
maybe it was a little earlier than that. Um, he signed on to there. You don't hear much about him even in the preseason training camp. And then all of a sudden, Aaron Rodgers talking about him. He's getting promoted to the active roster because of injuries. And he's getting receptions. He's getting a lot of playing time. He's working his way onto the roster with special teams. And now you fast forward to minicamp uh, last month. And he was getting a lot of the first team reps, even ahead of Josiah DeGuara. So Aaron Rodgers clearly likes him. Matt LaFleur clearly likes him. And, uh, I mean, it is a perfect tight end mold that Matt LaFleur has kind of been searching for over these past few years. Uh, I think Davis can do it all, really, and be that H-back that LaFleur is looking for. You also have Dominique Daphne in the mix and Big Beast player and Josiah DeGuara. So let's hear about Josiah, the former third-round pick, Big B. Oh, yes, Josiah DeGuara. Um, That Vikings touchdown, I forgot what week it is. Uh I I am still in, like, um, off-season brain mode. Like, my brain's not working at all right now. Yeah. But that Vikings touchdown, beautiful touchdown, by the way. You can see the confidence start to stack on top of each other every single week from that play. And I'm excited to see him build that confidence throughout the offseason. I definitely think he can capture that number one role in the offense. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see what he does. But what Tyler Davis said in an interview I just watched last night, all everyone in the tight end room, like all of them are so different. Like they all bring something that the other person doesn't bring to the room. So it's definitely going to be interesting to see who takes that number one role in the um, offense. And, of course, I'm rooting for Tyler Davis, but I definitely think it's Josiah DeGuara. Yeah, the quote from Davis is interesting, and it will be uh, extremely exciting once we get to 53-man roster time, once we get to roster cut down. So, my God, I can't wait. Like, that's going to be so exciting. Um, How they go about their tight ends, you know, and Tunyon, if he's on the active roster or IR or PUP to start the season, that will obviously depend on this. But, you know, are they going to keep – because, you know, Tyler Davis, Dominique Daphne, Josiah DeGuara, I mean, all of them are obviously worthy of making the roster. They've all got in playing time, and Mercedes Lewis is going to be a lock for the roster most likely unless he just goes out there and, you know, can't walk anymore. But, like – um, so if they keep all four of those who will be really interesting, all, well, all three of them have to fight for that spot, really. They have to prove that it's worth it. Um, special teams will obviously be a big part for all of them. So really excited to see how Brian Gudikins and Matt LaFleur go about that at the tight end position. Now, on to the offensive line, the big boys up front. A lot of questions there, too. Um, there was not a lack of depth, though. There is certainly a lot of guys, a lot of names uh, on the offensive line. The Packers drafts and uh, has it been three every year for the past three years? Like it's yeah, something it's, like that. yeah. Because this year they had Ryan, Tom, and uh, Walker, and then the year before that they had Newman. Lincoln uh, was Landon last year. I think Colvin Landon was last year. Uh, the year before that, you got Runyon, Hanson, and Stepaniak uh, from 2020. So they've added a lot of names to the offensive line room the last year. Uh, starting with offensive tackle, speaking of Colvin Landon, he's the player I'm watching just because at minicamp and OTAs, we heard that he was starting at right tackle, getting the first team reps at right tackle, which shows right tackle and left tackle spots with David Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins both recovering from their serious major injuries, um, you know, those are going to be two spots that even at the start of the season are going to be question marks. And I think that the phrase that Matt LaFleur likes to use of putting our best five out there will be more true than ever for this season when they're dealing with those two big losses on that line. Um, so you have Cole Van Landen, who's capable of playing right tackle. Apparently you have a lot of guards who play right or left tackle in college, but, um, apparently, you know, what we've heard at least is that they're too small to play tackle in the NFL. Royce Newman is one of those guys. 
Zach Tom, another I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, so who they throw out there at right tackle, left tackle for the preseason training camp will be interesting. Lanon, hey, man, his former six-round pick from Wisconsin, went to Bayport High School. Uh, that would be great to see him get that job, but obviously only if he's good. Um, <laughs> Big V, your player is one of my favorites on this team. Let's hear about Mr. Yash Nyman. Oh, yes. So, Yash is probably going to be the first one in line for the right tackle job. Mm -hmm. um, I think he hasn't played right tackle, like, in an actual game since college. So, like, I'm very interested to see how he comes in, like, out of nowhere and be right tackle. I didn't think it was going to be a good idea last year throwing him out at right tackle. Mm -hmm. But I'm slowly building the confidence that – he can do a fantastic job at right tackle. If he could do it on the left side, why not the right side? Yeah. So, Yash is my man. Yash is just like such a perfect example of a guy that has just been on the practice squad for years and years. And I'm like, okay, why are they holding on to this guy? And then suddenly things align. I mean, think of the things that had to happen for Yash to get in this lineup, right? Like David Bakhtiari, December 31st has a non-contact injury in practice. We're talking about practice, all right? And then Elton Jenkins goes down. Billy Turner faces an injury. So many things had to happen for Yash to get in this lineup. After being on the practice squad, since I want to say like 2018, 2019, like he's been on there a while, right? And he finally gets his chance, and he does not disappoint. Um I know he started early on in the season against San Francisco in like week three, week four. Um, and then obviously that longer stand later on in the season, he wasn't awful. He was, I mean, he was borderline good, borderline a good offensive tackle in the NFL. Like, right. So big fan of some Yash Nyman. He does have some big opportunities this year. Uh, can't let his guard down. It's definitely not his job to lose. But like you said, he will be, you know, he is the only one out of that group of guys that has playing experience. So he does have that edge on them. Now, on to interior offensive line. This isn't a guy that has something to lose necessarily, not a job to lose, but a rookie in Zach Tom who – was one of those players that I heard a lot about in the pre-draft process. And suddenly he's somehow available in the late fifth round for the Packers to pick. And I was like, Oh my God, like that's that Tom. And so they got their hands on him. Such a Packers pick solely because of his versatility. He's played pretty much every position on the offensive line at Wake Forest. So this offensive line competition, it's going to be riveting to watch. Um, and see who they throw out there at camp preseason. Like I said, Tom can pretty much be the de facto Elton Jenkins. Hopefully he can prove that he's a uh, able starter early on, and then they can just throw him in whenever there's an injury. So uh, pretty much the Lucas Patrick type, because Lucas Patrick, I mean, once again, I mean, there was a lot of things that had to happen in 2020 for him to get in the lineup. Corey Lindsley, or no, it was Lane Taylor. That went down in week one against Minnesota in 2020. And then Lucas Patrick becomes a starter for the rest of the year, right? Playing left guard and playing center. And then he's a starter all of 2021 uh, because Josh Myers faces some injuries and injuries happen all across the offensive line. So, hey, Lucas has earned his uh, earned his rep. Got a good contract for Chicago this year. Good for number 62 out there. Um, so, Zach Tom, if he can be that, if, you know, Zach Tom and from the fifth round can be a Lucas Patrick, somebody that you can throw in whenever there's an injury and not be worried, then that's a good pick. Mm -hmm. um, Big B, who do you have as your interior offense lineman? Okay, Mr. Royce Newman mm. is my boy here. Played, or I think he started every game in the regular season. Um, and then when the playoffs started to come around, like he actually was very impressive. Mm -hmm. Then the playoff game happened and he got kicked to the curb. I don't know yeah. why, but 
he got kicked to the curb. At this point, I think it's Sean Ryan versus Royce Newman for that guard spot. And, you know, he had his, he had his ups and his ups and downs, you know, but that's expected from a rookie. But Royce Newman is my guy in that underrated battle for the uh, right guard spot. Yeah. Royce, like you said, he had some, you know, he all throughout early on in his rookie season, he, you know, he played, you know, solid, but he just had like one or two plays a game that came at the worst possible time where he just like, I mean, his controller died, basically. He, his Xbox controller died in Madden and he just sat yep. Like it was hard to watch at some point, specifically, I think back to uh, the week six game again in Chicago. And I mean, he just got beat so many times, got outsmarted so many times. That was, that was difficult to watch uh, all Roy struggle there. Um, but yeah, he's, he's once again, another guy in that offensive line mix. Moving on to the defensive side of the ball, two first round draft picks on that side and a lot of interesting players to watch. Uh, starting off with defensive line, I'm going with the big trash can full of dirt out of Iowa, Mr. Jack Heflin, who uh, got – I don't think – I think he played in maybe one regular season game last year. Um, but we saw him in the preseason a lot. Um, we heard from his dad on Twitter. Great guy. Love me, Mr. Heflin, on Twitter. Um, and, you know, he was campaigning for his son to be on that active roster all season. And I very much was too, uh, just from what we saw in the preseason last year. And, like, anything other than Tyler and Lancaster was pretty much what I was hoping for. Um, oh God. So yeah, Jack Haflin, another great opportunity, earned some more, um, chances in the preseason, work his way up and hopefully have more of a role on this team to, you know, maybe, you know, earn that spot on the initial 53 man roster. Um, big B, I love your player, Mr. BJ Raji, the second, really. Well, I don't, I don't even know if that's a solid player comparison, but I just like calling him that because he's going to be a legendary defensive tackle. Uh, so tell us about Devontae Wyatt. Oh, Mr. Devontae Wyatt. We had him mocked to the Packers, I think. Every like, time. <laughs> yep. uh, yeah. Yeah. Once, once the Pats come on, like this man is going to be a problem. And I am mm-hmm. super excited to watch it. Devontae Wyatt has so much experience playing against the big colleges since he went to Georgia, he got facing Alabama a couple times a year. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely NFL caliber talent on those teams. Devontae Wyatt is going to be a problem this year. I am so excited to watch it from training camp to the regular season. Man, I am kind of in love with Devontae Wyatt. All right. Mm-hmm. Just saying. Yeah. I hope there's a similar shock factor to when people see you know, outside of the media, when people like us see Devontae Wyatt on that practice field for the first time, similar to a reaction when people saw TJ Slayton for the first time, which, by the way, that's another name to throw out there as someone who could uh, get a lot of opportunities this preseason. Um, but, yeah, hope we see him out there, just a big old powerful man. Um, and I, I don't think he even has to get his technique down his rookie year. And his rookie year, even if he can just be a body on that defensive line, eat up a few blocks, then, oh, man, that that's all we need his rookie year. Then after that, he can get that B.J. Raji working on and then, you know, work his way up to Henry Jordan level and then the greatest player of all time, you know, yes. a step-by-step progress by progress type thing. Yes. So that's the defensive line uh, for linebacker. I'm going with the other first round draft pick in Quay Walker. And I just watched a really nice film study on Quay Walker. Um, I'm going to attach a link to that video uh, in the description below, because I like for me to watch film, I kind of have to force myself to do that or at least, you know, actually like study it because I like rewatching games uh, from time to time. 
but I cannot, especially with college players, draft picks, I just cannot bring myself to watch that and try to learn about the player. But this video I watched, it's a great dude who was breaking it down, um, and he, he did it really well and explained what Quay can do in this Packers defense. So I'm excited to see that. Excited for training camp, at least. What I'm excited to see with Quay is his speed. When we get up there, that's going to be the one thing I want to see in a real person, real life, see how fast that man is, how fast he can. I mean, the 40-yard dash is one thing, but just like from side to side, how agile he is. Really excited to see that. Big B, who do you have here? I have Mr. Randy Ramsey. Went down with the ACL injury during camp last year, and I definitely thought he was going to be a a very decent piece behind the big three, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, if Darius didn't get his act together, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> but I have high hopes for Randy Ramsey this year. I am super excited to see how he does, especially on special teams. Like that man is going to be a key piece on special teams for mm-hmm. Rich Masaccia. Randy Ramsey is my boy. Yeah, maybe we should ration our talk about special teams now, or at least like not – like talk about it too much because when it comes to 53 man roster time, we're going to talk about that like at pretty much every second. So cannot, that's, that's the one thing about 53 man roster talk. Everybody on Twitter is like, well, can you play special teams? And it's a very true point, unfortunately. Yes. But yeah. Linebacker three, we're going to see plenty of, uh, I guess the preseason training camp is pretty much going to be tryouts or whoever wants to take a shot at playing behind Rashawn Gary and Preston Smith, a very needed um, position on this team right now. All right, we got two left, starting with cornerback here. Um, and Big B, I'll let you get yours out of the way with Keyshawn Nixon because I, I have to look up a 40 time for my players. So talk about, speaking about special teams, let's hear about Keyshawn Nixon. Oh, yes. Everyone thought when we signed him, he was going to be strictly for special teams. But then when OTAs mini camps came, he was cornerback for I am definitely excited to see where they play him. I definitely think he's going to be a slot corner for us, Hmm. mainly that Shannon Sullivan role potentially. So Keyshawn Nixon is a very interesting player to watch this offseason. Yeah, if he does get any reps on defense in the preseason, that will be interesting to see. Um, my player here is Rico Gafford. I've heard Andy Herman talk about him, and that's the only reason I have him down here. And I just looked this up. Rico Gafford being a 4.2 to 40 in 2018. He's a wide receiver with the Raiders. So um, I don't know if there's anything uh, to the fact that he knows a wide receiver and their every move, but um, hey, man, I'm excited to see this guy play. I think we need to work out some type of Deion Sanders type trick play with him, where we have him on offense for a play. That that would be lit. I I'd need to see that. But hey, if he can show out in the preseason, you know, earn himself a spot on the practice squad at least, work his way up. I'm all for that. Now on to safety. I went with Vernon Scott, um, you know, safety position. Another one just like outside linebacker. Depth is needed there. The Packers have posted on the Facebook job site that needed outside linebacker three and needed safety three slash dimebacker. Vernon Scott, I wouldn't say he's, uh, he hasn't shown us anything that would prove that he's the answer at that position. Um, I think Sean Davis is another good name to throw in here. He's kind of a veteran who's got a little bit of murmurs, a little bit of hoo-hoo and hoo-ha at uh, mini camp and OTAs from the reporters um, as possibly being able to play that safety role. Um, so preseason, I mean, I, I wish we could just have like blocks or like just tell the offense like, hey, for this play, can you not throw it over the top? And can you just see – how Vernon Scott looks as a dimebacker. Like, can we just come – they need to have that in preseason. I guess this is what joint practices are for, 
but like we need to see like test out specific things on defense on offense see how these players do um against you know not casual practices against their own team so yeah i guess that is a purpose of joint practices but vernon scott uh, and really anybody else who they throw out there for the running in that dime back position. So we don't have to pain ourselves in seeing Mark Andrews going for 800 yards or any other tight end or wide receiver just breaking out over the middle. Um, so please do that, friends. I mean, Quay Walker could provide that and pretty much eliminate this need. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say that. That's what Quay Walker's for. I, yeah, I, I guess so. Could uh, be who do you have here? I have Sean Davis, like, like you said, just like three seconds ago, like the reporters were talking about him a bit, starting to get the hype train rolling a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, He's kind of just throwing into that third safety role just out of nowhere, picked him up in like the middle of the season, I think. Yeah. Uh, So yeah, Sean Davis, why not try to do something productive? Yeah. Let me see when, okay. Sean Davis was a fifth round pick in 2021 to the Colts, I see. Wow, that's kind of quick to be uh, – he, he did not make the Colts roster last year. was cut as a fifth-round pick in his rookie year. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. But a 4.5540, uh, just short of six, uh, six foot, 202 pounds. Interesting. All right, interested to see what Sean Davis can do. Interesting to see if the hype is real about him. Uh, now three others we chose here. Um, just because one, one a player at one position is simply not enough. Uh, three players that I wanted to share. Juwan Winfrey at wide receiver. I'm trying to write an article, but my brain hurts after five minutes of writing. But I'm trying to write an article right now on Juwan Winfrey and Amari Rogers and how they're going to probably get a lot of opportunities early on, more so than people might think. Um, Juwan Winfrey has put together quite a few good mini camps. Quite a few good training camps. I do love how uh, everybody on Twitter, like all the reporters, were talking about this one catch Jawan had. Like, wow, the highlight of today was so far was Jawan Winfrey's one-handed catch that he went up and leaped for. And then I saw the video of it, like, the next day, and it's literally, like, one of those drills that, like, high school teams do where, you're like, the quarterback is just, like, tossing up throw after throw, really just to get the quarterback's arm ready. And then, like, the wide receiver's just running, like, five yards. <laughs> so, like, I was expecting this was, like, in two-minute drill. And Juwan was, like, 20 yards downfield. And he had, like, you know, a Megatron-type catch. And, no, it was really just a simple catch. It was still a good catch. But, you know, uh, Juwan, you know, he, he put together – or, no, he missed all the preseason last year, I believe, with the injury. And he's faced a lot of injuries – uh, early on in his career, and that's really what's kept him off the field. So if he can stay healthy this year, continue to put it together a few good practices, and then, hey, man, it, it's a crowded room at the wide receiver position, but, hey, if he can prove that he's better than everyone else, maybe earn that 53-man roster spot over a guy like Samari Torre or uh, Malik Taylor, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, and then I also had Tyler Goodson, who Big B talked about, and then Shamar Jean Charles, at cornerback going into his second year, really uh, apparently a kind of a, a milk toast rookie season for him at practices. We'll see if he does anything else this year. I'm just intrigued with him because he's a draft pick and we did not hear at all about him last year. Big B, uh, any of your three players that you wanted to sh- shine some light on? Yeah, well, we already talked to the, we already talked about Tyler Davis. Um, yep. Sean Runyon, we talked about him just a little bit. But the, my other player is Kingsley and Agbar. Like he he's up there with my boys this year. Mm-hmm. I feel like I have a lot of boys this year, but Rasul Douglas is on the goat level. Just okay. so- he is the boy. Yes, he is. Rasul now- is him. Yes. Like here's Rasul, here's Dean Lowry, here, and then here's like King. All right. Okay. Yeah, I'm ex- I'm excited to see what he does. I was really a big fan of him through the draft process, and I was super ecstatic when we drafted him. Mm-hmm. Player that I got a picture with at um, OTAs, but we're not. But that's that's for another day. Another day. <laughs> yeah, totally not biased. So, <laughs> a lot of faith in you, my man. All right. Well, that wraps up the one player at each position. 
we're looking at at training camp. Like I said at the top of the episode, only two weeks away. Thank goodness. Me and Big B will be in town for training camp August 7th through 11th. So we'll be there for the Sunday, the Monday, and the Wednesday practices that week. If you see us, come say hi. Uh, we'll talk to you if you don't look too creepy. Yes. <laughs> uh, so definitely looking forward to that. Um, a few other things in Packers news that has happened since the last time we reported is, unfortunately, the GOAT, the legendary, the one and only Kurt Binkert being released by the team. He got beat out by Danny Etling in a, a quarterback competition that I don't think was even planned at minicamp. So long live the Kurt Binkert era. One thing I did want to say is, like – my God, this is such a, a June thing to happen for Packers Twitter. Like, there's nothing going on. But when Kurt Benkert was released, the I don't even want to say the drama. It wasn't like drama. It was just like a messy reaction by all of Packers Twitter. There was a group that was saying, this is the dumbest move since signing Muhammad Wilkerson. <laughs> like, there was that, that group. And then there was also the group was like, well, um, you know, like, okay, that's fine. I have no emotion. I don't care if players uh, make a connection with fans. I don't care about that. We release them. It's football. Ah. And I think the answer, the reaction lies in the middle. You, if you're a fan of Kurt Binker, you know, you should like, I, I, I want to say you should, but it, like it's understandable to be sad that they release him. And you can separate the fact that, okay, this was a football move. Brian Gutekinds did not give two flyer and holler and whatevers about his Twitch streams. But there's also like, okay, hey, that's sad. Wish he was still on the team. My, my relationship, I guess, my my appreciation for his content doesn't change, but at the same time, he's a TikToker. He's very well known in the NFL community. It was fun to have him on my team. So apparent, like what I'm getting at with this is I feel like there was a group of fans who lost the idea of people can have like favorite players, right? Like, it doesn't have to be all based on, you know, football ability. Like, plenty of people's favorite players was Jamal Williams. And it's – most of that fandom wasn't because of his greatness on the field. It was because of his dancing. You know, he's always – he had his show on Game on Wisconsin where we got to know a lot about him. He was such an interesting guy. Mm-hmm. So – the fandom can be separated from just football and yeah. So I, I, I just wish <laughs> that people that the, the Packers would reaction to all of that was unnecessary. I was sad about it. I understand that it was a football move um, and going to miss you, Kurt. Still going to follow you on social media, obviously big, big, any thoughts you wanted to throw in there on my tangent. Um, yeah, I'm just going to say, I'm going to say two things. The people who are saying that Kurt Benkert is better than Jordan Love are clearly the stupidest people. Oh, I forgot him. about that. And, oh, wow. Um, they are, they are, they need to go to a mental asylum because that is the stupidest thing you could have possibly said. Oh my God. You Jordan make Love me want to like. Kurt Benkert, undrafted free agent. There's, there, they are not in the same world. Okay. Just saying. I just remember that. And that made me so angry. I want to like scram my laptop right now yes. that any that okay that gets to the the part of the fan base that was like this is so stupid who couldn't separate it from a football move who couldn't yes. realize that brian gudikins probably doesn't even know what a tick tock is probably has the same knowledge about it as brett Favre. let's make a tick tock all right this was a football move yes so oh my god you saw kurt binker in two and a half preseason games last year, and he looked decent. He looked, you know, decent in practice the few days that I was there last year. Like, he had, you know, the first day I was there, he did not look good. 
second, third day, he was fine. So the only reason that they thought that Kurt was better than Jordan Love was one, because we didn't see as much as Jordan in the preseason last year. You know, he, Jordan didn't have the best game in Buffalo. So, hey, Kurt could be better than Jordan Love. He could be miles better than Jordan Love. But to say that about Jordan Love, with the knowledge we have, is simply ridiculous. And it just is the preconceived notions, the confirmation bias of people wanting to be right about him being a bad draft pick. Stop that right now. Stop that. Okay. Long live the Kirpman Kerr era. We are ready to close the door on that discussion for now. And and wherever he moved, I hope they moved very close to a target for Scout because if not, that's just a travesty. Okay. Exactly. Like I hope they find another target that yep. is treats his kid Scout just as well because she is adorable. Yes. Um She's five, by the, or like three or four, by the way. She's not like 12 or 13. Yes. Um, so there's that. That would be <laughs> Maddie's got like a 14 year old girl who is just like emotionally unstable and like the only place she <laughs> like she can be happy as a target. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, on to uh, the other football news that has happened in the dead months of the offseason. Some very exciting news is that. Semifinalists for the senior class of the in a pro football hall of fame were announced and four Packers were a part of that list, including uh, scout slash personnel director from the 60s, 60s and Jack Venisi wide receiver, Sterling Sharp coach, Mike Holmgren and quarterback from the 1940s Cecil Isbell. Just the fact that these four guys got the, a mention in the semifinalist list makes me happy. Just the Mm -hmm. fact that there's a chance that any one of them get in makes me so incredibly happy. Um, No, Holmgren, it it actually kind of surprised me. Like when I look back at the the records of history, I was 30 years ago only, uh, that he was only with the Packers for six, seven years. Then he had that whole, you know, his relationship, with Ron Wolf kind of broke down and then he went to Seattle for a lot of the Packers staff with him, uh, went to a Super Bowl there. Uh, so yeah, it kind of surprised me how short his time was with Green Bay, but obviously he was a part of the game with Brett Favre and, uh, Bob, Barb hop, Bob, Bob Harlan and Ron Wolf that brought the Packers back to relevancy. So he obviously deserves uh, that Hall of Fame spot. Sterling Sharp uh, would have had a great career if his injury didn't stop him. He was having a great career. Um, and then Jack Venisi, I would be, I don't see it happening just because, like, unless they watch the Packers' legacy series, the voters aren't truly going to understand his impact on, you know, the first comeback of the Packers' relevancy in the late 1950s with all the incredible drafts he had. Um, Seriously, like I said, don't think he's going to get in. But the fact, especially him, that he his name is brought up uh, is great to me. And then finally, Cecil Isbell. We had Wes Hockwitz on last year around this time, and he had his bio as Cecil Isbell deserves to be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So Wes, I know, is happy about that news. And, hey, if they're able to find a, a good page or two about Cecil that they think is worthy of getting him into the hall, let's make it happen. Um, because that would be, you know, I, I there was a quarterback other than Favre and Starr in the Hall of Fame, isn't there? Is it Herber? Yes. Okay. So make Isabel the de facto will be the number five Packers quarterback in the Hall of Fame. Make that happen, please. Yes. Uh, um, Big B. Any uh, cases you wanted to make for any of those four guys? All, all I'm going to say is I need Jack Venisi Hall of Fame merch more than I need air. Yeah. Like I put that on Twitter. Like it, mm-hmm. I need it. I need it to survive. Yes. It's the only thing I need in my life. I need a Jack Venisi bobblehead. I need a Jack Venisi pin. I, I, I need it. 
I need Jack Venisi merch on the Packers Pro Shop. That that would be great. Um, get a Jack Venisi like at least a mini statue of him in the Hall of Fame. I need that to happen. Other than that, uh, one last thing I wanted to end it off with is our training camp bucket list. Like I just mentioned a few minutes ago, me and Big B have now their second or third week, uh, the week ahead of the first preseason game, heading out there to training camp. I need to know, Big B, where I'm sure we're going to have plenty of uh, Zoom calls planning out our trip in the coming weeks. But I need to know what is on your training camp bucket list. What do you need to happen for you personally? Not necessarily like Christian Watson balling out, but like what do you need to happen on your trip there for you personally? Um, I'm going to say possibly going to Corey Banky's house. Like that, I think that will always be number one. That's never going to happen because I'm not up to that status yet. Not even close to that status yet, but hopefully that happens one day. And probably just collecting a bunch of autographs, as many as I possibly can in the three days that we're going to be there. Okay, my one and only answer here is high-fiving Joe Barry. That Ooh. has to happen. I need to see the greatness of this mid forties man in person. I need to see with my own eyes. I need to get a high five, get a picture, whatever, man. I need to make that happen. Yes. He's on my autograph bucket list. So just stay by me and it'll probably happen. Okay. I'm excited to get the full training camp experience this year. See all the little annoying kids on their bikes. I shouldn't call them annoying. They're part of the great state of Wisconsin, but I'm, I'm excited to like get that. Cause last year, completely different. Um, I was a bike kid once in like 2013 when I went, I think like we literally packed me and my brother's bike in the, the trunk of my van or the family's van, or maybe we rented one, but either way, did not get our, uh, our bikes ridden. My brother got a high five from Clay Matthews. So that was cool. Uh, but the one thing too, though, about the bikes is at least for last year, you, if you wanted a seat, you, you couldn't watch the bikes because yeah. I mean, you got to get at the practice for like at least 25 minutes beforehand to be there, get a good spot. Um, and this year I'm sure it's going to be much more crowded by the way, uh, excited to take in all the vibes of Packers training camp this year. Once again, only two weeks away. Um, very exciting time here in green Bay. So thank you everybody for watching. Uh, let us know your thoughts on this episode in the comments down below. Uh, let us know your, the players you're watching at training camp and preseason this year. And we'll talk to you later. As always, go Pack Go.